My name is Tony Federico. I'm the VP of Marketing for Natural Force. Um, I've had the pleasure of being at AHS. Uh, this is my third or fourth year, I believe. I think maybe actually fourth year. They all start. They all start running together. But um, anyway, I uh, have had the fortune of of meeting and, and knowing all these folks for many years, going back to the first Paleo FX event, and have been able to kind of grow with the paleo movement. And one of the things that I wanted to do here this year is to give everybody an opportunity to just kind of do a little bit of a pulse check and say, hey, we've been doing this, you know, for how long now are we moving the needle? How are we actually uh, changing the game? Are we actually making an impact? Um, what is the state of paleo? So that's what brings us here today. And just in case anybody is not familiar with any of our panelists, I, I, th I think for the most part, you know who these folks are. But um, we'll go through it anyway. Starting on the end there, we've got Rob Wolf, former research biochemist, health expert, and author of the New York Times, the New York Times bestsellers, The Paleo Solution and Wired to Eat. Rob Wolf, welcome. Go ahead and give him a round of applause. Come on. <laughs> then we have Norda Jed Gaudis. Nora, Nora Jed Gaudis. Ged Gaudis. There we go. I'm sure it's happened once or twice before. <laughs> Uh, health writer, speaker, educator with 20 years clinical experience in working with the brain in foundational slash functional medicine, author of the best-selling books, Primal Body, Primal Mind, uh, has a new book, Primal Fat Burner, teaches a popular weekly ed accredited educational program, Primal Restoration. She's just crushing it all across the board. Nora, welcome. Give a round of applause. And I'm just going by my list, by the way, in case I'm not skipping you, Denise or Aaron. Daryl, <laughs> favoritism. It's looks, that's what we're doing. Daryl, uh, owner of Fitness Explorer Training, international speaker, certified personal trainer, nutritional therapist, and award-winning author of Paleo Fitness and Paleo from A to Z, which I believe uh, Gandalf actually was the narrator of your book. He was. Quite a, quite a catch there. And then sitting next to Daryl, we have Michelle Norris. Michelle is a former corporate warrior, trained chef, multi-potentialite, whose personal health issues and struggles with traditional medicine orthodoxy inspired her to upend the way the world tackles health. She did that by starting or co-founding Paleo FX, which maybe some of you guys have been there, the largest paleo event in the world. Give it up for Michelle. <laughs> and Daryl. <laughs> And Daryl. We love you, Daryl. Most awkward introduction ever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's fine, man. We'll just rock with this. Um, then we got Denise. Denise Minger is a health blogger, public speaker, nutritional consultant, author of Death by Food Pyramid, a book that explores the somewhat shaky foundations of what we believe about food. Welcome, Denise. And then last but certainly, certainly not least, we have Dr. Aaron Blaisdell, UCLA professor of psychology, member of the UCLA Brain Research Institute, Integrative Center for Learning and Memory, and the Evolutionary Medicine Interdisciplinary Center. Dr. Blaisdell is the co-founder of the Ancestral Health Society and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Evolution and Health. Welcome. So just to start things off, um, What's the what's the status of the patient? You know, if we're talking about health, you know, here in the paleo movement, we don't define health as simply the absence of disease. We look at it as vitality. We look at it as energy, as well-being. So, from that framework, what's the status of paleo? What's the health of the paleo movement at large? And uh, let's go ahead and start with you, Michelle. I think that one's good. Is that better? Oh yeah. Okay. So state of state of paleo. What's how's the patient looking? Um, actually, the patient is looking a whole lot better than we originally thought. Um, a lot of you may know that at Paleo FX, we made the announcement that we were going to rebrand and remove the paleo from our name, and we were going to go to Health FX. I believe you probably all got a if you're on our list. Sorry, I assume. Um, it, that uh, we have made the decision not to rebrand. And uh, it was over, yes. Oh, wow. Breaking news. Yeah. 
And um, we had overwhelming response. Um, very, very positive. That a lot of people were saying, yes, it's the right move. You should do it. Um, but then we had some branding experts that came to us and said, hey, we really think you should rethink this. And um, so once they did that, uh, we first we told them, look, we don't have any money to pay you. But they were like, that's OK. We just really have a we have a vested interest in this. And so they just showed us how we are actually not tapping into. And it's probably across the board. It's probably all of us. We're not tapping into. Um, equity on the web that we could be and so they when they showed us that it just was kind of overwhelming and the thing is is that we were running into a lot of roadblocks with um, the paleo moniker we were seeing a lot of people really kind of resistant to it because a lot of people come to it with the preconceived notions about what it is oh it's just a uh, incredible amount of bacon it's um lots of yeah i mean yeah uh, so much bacon and raw bacon and you know it raw <laughs> anyway raw that was one of the ones i got all the time was how do you eat all that raw meat and i'm like um i don't there was this thing invented called fire and we went from there and so um it's interesting because literally uh, when we decided to change to Health FX, we had, um, we had been to a, another conference where a lot of people know who we are. We're in the paleo. Movement. Oh, I, couldn't, I could never do paleo. It's just too restrictive. And I, I always ask the question, okay, what's your, what, what is your eating habits? What's your um, dietary lifestyle? What is that? And literally, I had 10 people tell me this at this conference. Six of them all answered Whole30. And I went, okay. Uh, so we just really started getting the message that it, the thing is, is that, you know, obviously Dallas and Melissa did an, an incredible job with moving away from the paleo moniker because it's not tied to it, but yet it's exploding and it is paleo. And so it's an interesting thing. So we started seeing that. I personally think we, um, we are going to have resistance. It's just going to be part of the journey. And, um, but I think that the patient is very well and doing well. And um, we see it with um, per particularly things like, uh, we just had KetoCon this last week in, uh, in Austin. And um, you have keto. We have all of these different things that are under the umbrella of paleo. And a lot of people are like, um, so we have Whole30 uh, keto. We have low carb. We have, you know, At Atkins is kind of there. But, you know, all of these things that kind of fall under our umbrella. And people think, well, that's kind of muddying the water. And I say it's um, diversifying our part portfolio. So the thing is, paleo is a jumping off point. And I think that as long as people understand that, that it's the jumping off point, you can decide to go keto, you can decide to go low carb, you can go primal, you can do whatever it is that you want. And I, I think we're going to see a lot of longevity for, for a while. So long and short. Sorry. Great. So Daryl, you're a, uh, spend a good amount of your time across the pond, which is in England, for those who don't know, um, what do you see? What do you see happening overseas? Yeah, so I am the token British guy on the panel. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thought you get that. Um, English, British humour, right there. So, um, well, in terms of the state of paleo, uh, I am eternally grateful to paleo and the paleo lifestyle, uh, especially because for me, it was far more than just the dietary change. Um, I think it's, and again, it's, this is my journey, but I feel it was the first time that I felt there were so many answers available to me around living a more holistic lifestyle. Um, and, and that, and seeing that kind of being constantly explored um, and seeing far more discussions around the aspects of a healthier lifestyle which don't just gravitate towards food, that's what I feel is probably the most powerful and potent message around paleo and really is a fantastic antidote to chronic lifestyle disease. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm just really happy <laughs> personally and want to celebrate the fact that I encountered the paleo lifestyle. Well, and, 
And we've got a uh, the Berlin PaleoCon is on their second year and probably going on their third year. So now we're starting to see uh, some movement in that space as well. Um, I believe you have been to one of those events, right? Yeah, I've been to the Berlin uh, Paleo Conference. Um, I actually hosted uh, a conference called Health Unplugged, uh, which Rob uh, was involved with, um, kind of satellite linked into a conference. So paleo uh, is really important across the world. I mean, Australia has a really fantastic paleo presence. Um, it's become part of vernacular, part of the vernacular, uh, even if you don't mention the paleo term. So, um, so yeah, it's lots, lots is happening across across the world, all on the back of of paleo. So, yeah. Can I take it for a second? One thing I'm going to add to that is, um, you know, we've since year one of Paleo FX, we've had a lot of people asking us to come overseas. Um, Australia, we went actually out to London and realized we were not ready to to go. We plan to do that in the next um, year or two, but. I, the amount of people that are doing this particularly and i know nora can speak to this australia she goes to australia and speaks there uh, to lots of people we have an entire group that's there ready to go and ready to blow paleo fx up overseas and um so i, I think it's been pretty amazing but i'm gonna let nora finish that <laughs> So yeah, I see a couple of different things happening. I remember at the very first AHS at, at UCLA, um, I thought, ah, this is amazing. I mean, I didn't know there was a paleo movement. Somebody called me and said, yeah, we're going to have this conference. I'm like, wow, there's, there are other books on this subject matter out there. Wow, OK, cool. Um, and I remember looking around and being really glad that we were doing this thing and having everybody come together in a really congenial fashion and sharing this, uh, all this information and the science-based information, whatever else. But I also could see that there was a, there was a danger that was going to emerge, that whenever you have something that's, that's a really kind of popular idea kind of take off, you have industry take interest. And so what's occurred in part is that there's been a tremendous you know, commercialization and paleo's kind of come to mean whatever anybody kind of wants it to, um, which is a little bit of a concern, I think. Uh, there's many different versions of it out there. Is there people claiming to practice it? I've seen peanut butter and banana sandwiches on YouTube be, you know, presented as paleo and all that kind of thing. Um, and so the, the danger of this being co-opted by multinational interests and taken over uh, and, you know, for the sake of profit and then turned into a fad instead of a real bona fide health movement is a real concern. Um, the other thing I see happening is that the powers that be are starting to kind of get restless and sit up and take notice. Um, you know, of course, we had the recent kind of pushback with the American Heart Association and that ridiculous, um, you know, uh, presidential advisory. I'm sure you guys are all familiar. You can read about it on my blog at great length if you'd like. But anyway. Um, and this is actually happening big time in Australia. It's terrifying there, actually. Um, you, anybody that is publicly promoting paleo is a danger, in danger if you're a practitioner of losing your license. I mean, it's, it's very serious over there. Uh, industry is not taking it sitting down. A, f a few years back, actually, was an article in the Sydney Herald. Um, and I was, I was the first person to ever go over and talk about paleo. And, and it took off over there like crazy. And I've gone over, you know, once or twice a year uh, since then, um, not this year for, for a change, but um, to talk about it. And anyway, it's taken off in no small way over there. And it's become a real threat. Uh, the American Dietetic, Asso or excuse me, the Australian um, Association of, uh, a, Australian Dietetic, there are Dietetic Association of Australia, that's it, DAA. Anyway, um, they're not taking it sitting down. Um, in any case, there was a, an article in the Sydney Herald a few years back. Um, Lisa found it online one day and said, wow, this is really cool, where they had said that the eating habits of Australians, they were cutting 20% of, or, or of the carb and gluten consumption had, had, I mean, had come down in that entire country. And you know, you've you got to realize that represents trillions of dollars, you know, to manufacturers, to the big agribusiness, to the food industry, you know, to undertakers, you know, whoever else. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I think that, you know, that drum is starting to beat over there. And it's, it's not, I mean, I think we need to take a look at, you know, th that's coming. 
that's coming. It's happening there now, but it's coming. And so we need to be mindful. One of the things I think is really necessary is to come to some sort of unified definition, you know, of what paleo actually means, because otherwise it's just a buzz term that gets, you know, labeled a fad, and then that's all that it is. So a couple things I would like to see. I would like to see the idea of, um, you know, paleo being maybe a, a proposed definition, you know, and on, a focus on um, on health and diet, or, you know, lifestyle and diet that is of uncompromising quality and also in alignment with our evolutionary and genetic heritage. And that could mean a lot of different things. Um, I know how I like to look at that, but, but at the very least, um, you know, coming to some sort of unified, di you know, um, uh, definition, I think, could be helpful. The other thing is that rather than being seen as an industry that is looking to profit from every little thing associated with its popularity, using our 15 minutes of fame to advance improvements in the way our food is produced and in the health of not just human beings but also of the planet would be something that I think would help the image a great deal and, and restore maybe a bit of credibility that perhaps has been lost through all kinds of Oh, um, what do you call it? Um, you know, negative associations. There's a term, but I bad can't think press. of it right now. Yeah, bad press and just sort of uh, stigmas, right? Stigmas that get attached to this. So anyway, that's that's my two bits, and I'll pass it on to Denise. Hi. Um, so. From a longevity standpoint, I think paleo has one really big thing working in its favor, which is that it is currently the only diet slash health movement that is flexible enough to evolve. And if you look at almost every other diet that's out there right now that's popular, you know, the whole foods plant-based diet is always going to be basically the same template. They're not going to change their ideas or the way that they promote information. Atkins diet is always going to be the Atkins diet. Mediterranean diet is always, always going to be associated with olive oil and whatever vegetables and legumes. You know, there's a certain template that people are going to associate with all of these things that really cannot be changed even if new information comes in. The paleo movement might be held back in a lot of ways by the, the term paleo, but the underlying forces that create that movement and comprise it right now is very growth oriented. And it's probably the only movement right now that can say that about itself. Um, if you look at the progression of what paleo has been since it was first started to be popularized, you know, decades ago, it has changed from a very strict, no salt, no green beans, no blah, 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 rigid grokate this template to something that's more like, well, maybe legumes can be okay for some people because of X, Y, Z. Maybe we shouldn't be eating XYZ food even though Paleo Man ate it because of this new information that's come in. So we see this progression and this internal evolution within this movement that is, in my opinion, probably going to keep it relevant for a long time. The word itself, Paleo, might go up and down in terms of Google Analytics and who's Googling it, who's eating it right now. But the concepts that are being created, promoted, and explored within communities like this, those are going to stay around because it's keeping in touch with where the evidence is actually going. And that's, I'm somebody who hates labels in general. I stay away from them. I still associate myself with this movement specifically because there is that opportunity to grow within it. I don't think it's fixed. I don't think that it's a slave to its own dogma. It can be in some, sen some sense, but in a general one, it is um, more future oriented, growth oriented, and evidence oriented than any other movement that's around right now. So again, it's like other people have mentioned, um, we have to get over that commercialization aspect. We have to get over the negative press, the hype around things that should not be hyped. But if we stay true to the goal of making information as accurate as possible as we pump it out into the public and start to change public opinion about what foods are good for me versus bad for me, that is going to keep this movement afloat for a very long time. So I live in a very strange and bizarre world called academia. <laughs> it's a parallel universe to, I think, the real world. Um, I actually enjoy that world very much because we get to nerd out. 
And when I discovered the whole kind of paleo approach, diet, lifestyle, and everything about nine years ago, and I had profound changes in my own physiology and mental um, health and everything, I was hooked. I realized that there's so much science behind this. And as uh, Denise was saying, it's the science is not about a set of facts. The science is something that grows and evolves over time. It's a process by which we evaluate our evidence. It's a process by which we can keep testing and improving and changing and learning what works and learning what doesn't and just honing over time. That's science, both at the personal level and at a level of, of as a society uh, process. And so that's why we started the Ancestral Health Symposium and had our first event in 2011 is because when I was coming to other faculty in my department, other departments across campus at UCLA or at conferences and talking about my health changes and how eating differently and sleeping better and the, all these other factors was really improving things and the science behind it, I met so much resistance, even anger by certain people. Um, about the idea that saturated fat could be healthy, the, the idea of uh, these uh, other kind of paleo processes, paleo template ideas. And so we started the conference and we didn't use the term paleo because I think we felt that it was potentially a pigeonhole. Uh, it, was, it was already acquiring within academia especially this kind of n real negative connotation. And so we thought ancestral health, it's about what happens, to, you know, where you come from, both as a species or as an ethnic group or as uh, a, a community member or even yourself over time as you develop through childhood and adulthood, that's part of your ancestral heritage at all those levels. So we thought it was a nice term that captures all of, the, all of that. And so th the question is, what is the state of paleo? What's the state of ancestral health? For me, I'm interested in what's the state in academia, because that's where really, when they get on board, scientists and the medical schools that are teaching our medical doctors and our nurses and our dentists, um, when these people go out into the real world to practice, they're going through medical schools, they're going through dental schools, they're going through uh, a university system. We're trying, I'm trying to see if that's changed that resistance, and what seems to me is that it is. I'm actually surprised at how quickly I'm seeing people within my community who five years ago would have been like, oh, that's all woo-woo stuff. They're starting to s come to these ideas themselves. And the literature is actually starting to change. Now, the funding agencies like the National Institute of Health, which is the major funding source of our government for U U.S. Um, medical research, is very slow to adopt, especially in certain segments like nutrition. But there are other segments where it's starting to make faster inroads, like in developmental biology uh, and, and some other areas. And so I, what I see is it's a, it's a very uh, complex process, many different w uh, segments within the academic scientific community, the ivory towers. And I see that it's slowly, uh, maybe not so slowly, it's gradually, but quickly picking up steam that we're getting these ideas. They're not calling them paleo, of course. They're not even calling them ancestral health, but it's the ideas. They're finally emerging. They're finally becoming more widespread in the academic community. And that, to me, is a big promise, because now that's going to filter out into policy boards uh, at the American Heart Association. People who come from academia sit on those boards. It's going to set the stage for changes at those top levels, which hold a lot of the purse strings and power structures for how we talk about health in our modern world. So I, I won't go further on that, but that's a good news, I think. Is, is that horse beat to death, or do you want me to throw in a thought or two? We can uh, we can throw a little wrinkle at you. Okay. I do, although I did, I, I am um, one thing that I was going to mention. I am actually a huge fan of the uh, market elements of commercializing this whole movement. Um, I, I debated between wearing this shirt or a shirt that looks like a Coca Cola bottle and it says "Enjoy Capitalism." So <laughs> I come at this from a really different perspective. Uh, I see that monetization scheme being really critical to building bridges between the medical, the food consumption, and the food production system. Epic Bar is a great example of that. Those people give a lot of money to the Savory Institute. The Savory Institute is kind of 
like our Obi-Wan, you are our only hope for having a credible entity go in and say, hey, if we had lots and lots of big herbivores eating grass that are converting sunlight into energy that we can't use directly, but we can use indirectly, and we can build this whole huge diversified ecosystem, somewhat like what the Americas and the rest of the world looked like before humans spread across the world and killed all the megafauna, it might actually be good. And all those things can actually dovetail together. So I, I actually get really nervous about an idea of trying to uh, codify anything in this. I would like lots of different systems, lots of different ideas, all of them competing, kind of like a computer operating system, and let those things, let the, the merit emerge based off of the efficacy instead of trying to have some, all of us are flawed. I, I, I trust the, the average of people much more than a group of folks deciding the policy. So that's that piece, so. You know, it's interesting, you mentioned the commercial side you know, I came from kind of a paleo journalism uh, place, working with Paleo Magazine and, and doing podcasts for them. And now I'm with a natural food company. And I see what we have to do to really convince suppliers to give us products that don't have additives. And, you know, it's not just convincing academia, it's convincing manufacturers of food products. And you have to have people getting in there and getting their hands dirty and doing that work and fighting those battles to, to change the game. And at the end of the day, now we do have grass fed just about everything now. Um, and people are buying those products. I think from the, the market perspective, and some I'd like some insight on, is do you think that the majority of paleo products are accessible to the average person, uh, even just from a price point uh, perspective, or does it still kind of uh, achieve the aims of supporting the health of maybe the upper middle class, but doesn't really trickle down to the people who might be in more food desert kind of type of situations? Oh, man, you're, you're just throwing... <laughs> softball pitches over the plate here. Um, so th this is one of the, the big criticisms of paleo is that it's white, middle class, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When the microwave oven was first cracked open in, into the, the consumer space, in today's dollars, a microwave oven would cost about $40,000. And due to Moore's law and innovation, microwave ovens are now effectively disposable items. About $15. You could argue that these would be like a single use type of thing. And so the wealthy subsidized this whole innovative process and developed a system for innovation that made these things inexpensive and accessible. And at every smartphone that we have, you know, everything is like that. And food is, follows a similar, although not a perfect Moore's Law type of example. But, you know, Australia is interesting. You pay more money there for grain finished meat because it costs more because you've got different energetic inputs into the whole thing. So I think that we just have a situation where right now a certain subsection of people are subsidizing the development of this process. But as we get more and more players, as we get two or three Epic Bar iterations that are all sourcing grass-fed meat, grass-fed meat costs are going to come down. And, and uh, uh, you know, we had an idea about doing an Epic Bar um, back in 2003. But at that point, if you wanted to deal with meat, it always had gluten in it. And if you had gluten-containing items, then they never dealt with meat. And, you, you know, so there was no facilities to even do what we wanted to do. Like, I showed... Uh, uh, Taylor and, and uh, those folks, the recipes that we had, and they were virtually identical to what they had developed. We were just a decade early on it. So I think that we can develop a lot of uh, uh, scale by just letting this whole thing move, and you just can't overly criticize it. It's a process. Like, again, the next year will be 20 years of me fiddling with this stuff. And the first time that I stumbled onto the term paleo, there were probably like 200 people on the planet that knew what a, quote, paleo diet was, and most of them were in academic settings, and there was very little awareness just in a, a general uh, public kind of scenario. But now in Reno, Nevada, if I do a, a talk for like natural grocers and they advertise it just in their grocery store, we'll get 200 people showing up at that. It's some podunk backwoods, you know, city like, like Reno. So I think we've grown enormously. I think there's still huge upside. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. One of the other things I think too is um, completely agree with um, Rob, uh, but also it's the education piece is when you start eating this way, you actually spend a lot less money. 
And the problem is, is that the initial tick, big ticket item, meat and that type of thing, vegetables, um, that's where we all still have a lot of job security because it's education too is letting people know in the long run, this is going to cost you less. You pay now or you pay later. Um, I'm going to have a contrarian point of view on this. Um, I, I, I come from a very impoverished background and I was fortunate enough to do very, very well for myself uh, working for leading investment banks around the world. Um, and, uh, and this uh, kind of elitism that exists isn't just about a price point. It isn't just about market penetration. Um, there are families that do not have access to this information. And it, I feel the paleo movement in 20, 30, 40 years will probably be like yoga is today. From the 60s until now, yoga is still predominantly white, middle class women. It's still relatively elitist. Even though the price point has come down, even though it's, there's a lot of market penetration, it still appeals to a certain demographic. And so, look at the audience here. Look at the audience at Paleo FX. It's still predominantly a certain demographic. And I feel we need to do a lot more to reach out to the masses um, rather than expecting them to come to us. There has to be simplification of the message. There has to be a real desire to want to help those who really need our help. So when I communicate even to my family members who suffer from ill health, who don't have great incomes, who don't have time to listen to podcasts or read books, who are working two or three jobs, um, I can't talk to them about the scientific evidence <laughs> as to why this is the lifestyle you need to leave. I can't just tell them even about my own story in terms of how my health improved. And this is something that we really need to, to crack. Uh, um, and it, after coming to these events for several years, it, it really does pain me, to be honest, that this is still uh, the state of paleo and that our audiences aren't more diversified and that we still believe it's purely about personal responsibility. Because um, when I started this journey, it was about personal responsibility. It was about what I could do to get better. But then there are family members of mine who passed away. My sister passed away last year, for example, of cancer. And you realize <laughs> there's far more to this and what we're trying to achieve than intellectual knowledge, than research, than market forces. It's about a passion and desire to help those around us, the nearest and dearest, and to those that we can reach out to and help. So that's what I wanted to say. Okay, can I have the next? So, so we just heard two very opposing predictions. Um, Rob Wolf took the sugar model, where sugar used to be for rich white people, and now it's everywhere from market forces. Um, and Daryl said maybe the yoga model, where it's just still kind of a very restricted clientele base. And, and you did put your finger on education being a critical piece. And my hope is that in addition to this conference, in addition to what things like books that you're writing and other people are writing, uh, and our own personal stories that we keep telling, and those are critical, those are critical, but in addition to that, the only way, I don't think that paleo could go like sugar because it's not addictive. That Sugar's got that going for it. It's got this addictive-like quality to it. Ever had bacon? I don't oh, know, sorry. it's kind of addictive. <laughs> I've had bacon pretty much every day and it's not addictive the way sugar is. It's tasty, but it's not hyper palatable. So the, getting the education piece, it needs to become something that is common knowledge, that is any person working in a community, whether they're a doctor or a dentist or a school teacher or somebody within a rich community, a poor community, a middle class community, no matter what the ethnic makeup, if we can get those people that are community leaders to be knowledgeable, generally knowledgeable about the principles of ancestral health, paleo diet, lifestyle, and the role that these 
principles play, these kind of factors play in our everyday health. That's the, the key. That's what we need to solve that puzzle. And just from my own perspective, I imagine academia, I'm going to keep trumping that because that's where I am, hopefully can play a role in that, in that we are helping to train the teachers, we're helping to train the doctors that go out in the real world and join all these different com diverse communities. So that hopefully in addition to all our personal efforts, uh, blogging, writing, podcasting, uh, and coming to these conferences, hopefully we can also find ways to bring this to our K through 12 education setting, bring these to our doctors and dentists office and all the community. And so hopefully within academia, and I've been trying to do this by lecturing the pre-med students about paleo diet and lifestyle um, and the science behind it, trying to indoctrinate them uh, and inoculate them with the ideas about science and evidence um, at, before they go on to med school. And I'm hoping that more people, you guys in the audience who have this say in uh, training people who are going to go out into the, these different communities can help um, impart the message that way and, and change our standards and change our knowledge base. One of the, uh, yeah. So I, I, love, I love what Daryl said. And, and one of the myths I would like to crush yesterday, <laughs> if not you know, 10 years ago, is the idea that, that, that this way of eating of necessity is more expensive. Now, I mean, if, if you're you know, eating grass-fed you know, prime rib every night or something, then yeah, you got me there or whatever. But, um, well, for starters, there's nothing, there's nothing more expensive to our society than the standard American diet. Um, number one cause of bankruptcy in this country is a bad diagnosis. Unfortunately, most people don't have the frontal lobes to think ahead. You know, they're, they're, you know we, we have uh, this adolescent society that just knows what, it's wa what it wants right now. Food has become a nutrient devoid source of entertainment and uh, as opposed to a source of, of nourishment and foundational to health and in part you know, those, th that's the way, you know, we've been taught to think about it and the way media encourages us to think about it. Um, you know, there was somebody that I worked with uh, who, uh, <laughs> who at my behest uh, named a, a little e-book she put together called Primal Tightwad. And <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of fabulous. But anyway, one of the wonderful things that she did was she took a week's worth of menu from the standard American diet, the type of eating that everybody thinks, or not, well, not everybody, but the, that the general public thinks that's all they can afford, right? And she priced it out to the last penny, what it costs for one person to eat that way for one week, and did the best she could at, at making it a representative, you know, three meals a day, you know, trips to McDonald's, your hamburger helper, your, you know, whatever, one tablespoon of ketchup, one penny, whatever. This person's just like brilliant with, with budgeting. She knows to the last penny what she spends every single month on everything. And by the way, she, she lives on 20,000 bucks a year, pretty much owns her own home almost outright, and has a lot of leisure time um, because she's figured out how to make the most of every dollar. And she told me that she found the way uh, of eating that I, you know, that I talked about to be actually the least expensive way she'd ever found to eat well. And, and I, that's when I went on one knee and I said, would you please write this book and call it Primal Tightwad. The other thing she did was that she took a week's worth of menu from the type of uh, eating that I talk about and priced that out to the last penny. I would have been prepared to hear that it costed a little more, and I would have said, yeah, but we have to think of the long term in terms of health care costs, whatever. Not only was it less expensive to eat that way, but it actually worked out to be about close to $1,500 per person per year, less expensive. So there, there's a myth associated with this, and I think a lot of us buy into it, that it's more expensive. Processed food is really, really freaking expensive, folks. You know, what, what the industry is, what industry is selling us is really expensive, and it's unnecessarily expensive. I'm not prepared to put my faith in multinational industry to, you know, take care of our best interests here. They're always going to take care of their own bottom line. They're, they're you know, their, um, their obligation is not to create a product that is safe, um, you know, that, that is healthy, uh, or that is anything but profitable to its shareholders. That's their bottom line, you know. It's their bottom line isn't the same one as ours. And so I think the two things we need to rely on uh, and, and have some faith in, one is um, not just science, but I independent, non-corporately funded science that is not ghost-written, right? Um, and also y y finding a common ground amongst ourselves where the same things 
even though a lot of us have different ideas about what an optimal diet ought to be, we need to be able to come together at least on, on what it is as a core issue that, that we all share. And then we all need to kind of focus on what we all have in common instead of all the ways in which we're different in the way we see it. And, and find ways of, you know, combining our, our talents and our resources and our, uh, and our outreach to be able to get this message to the people, especially low-income people, that need to hear it. You know, nothing makes me sicker than, the, than seeing people filling their shopping carts full of, ho you know, hostess ding-dongs and, you know, I mean, whatever else, cheese doodles, you know, um, and soda. Uh, and, and feeling like that's all they can afford. We need to do better than that. You know, in, in Portland, we have a, a, a farm called Heart to Heart Farms. They do everything right. Everything's grass-fed. Everything's organic. Everything, whatever. They've raised more money, actually, for uh, underprivileged Oregonians than the Oregon Food Bank. There was like over 500,000 tons of food they raised last year or something. And not only that, if you go to their farm, now I, I wish more, more farmers and ranchers would follow this model. If you go to their farm and ranch and you say, look, um, you know, we're on food stamp, we don't have money, we would like to be able to feed our family better with the kind of food you grow. They say, great, fabulous, you know, what, what do you know how to do? You know, and they'll put them to work for a couple of days helping around the farm, and at the end of a couple of days, they've got a whole box of the best quality food money can buy to feed their families with. They've never turned anyone away because of a lack of money. This is the kind of stuff we need to be innovating, right? Because this is about the health of our society and our, and our planet at stake. And I'm not prepared to trust industry and capitalism to carry that flag for us. I'm sorry. I, I, so I take a little contrary viewpoint, but I respect Rob. <laughs> so anyway. It, I'll just throw something out there really quick because Denise is going to say something far smarter than what I'm going to say. But, uh, uh, we were chatting on a, a podcast, and something that is often missed when people start talking about this is that people who are coming from developing countries that uh, uh, are, say, new to westernized uh, countries, it's a sign of affluence to eat processed food. And that is something that is missed every damn time that we start having this discussion. Like, there's some onus put on the, the culture at large when in fact what is being attempted is to show, hey man, I made it. And so the, the topic is much more complex than like we need to do outreach. The topic is that these folks are trying to attain the American dream, the Western dream, and part of the Western dream is looking like eating what everybody else is perceived to eat. And so that's a whole other layer to this thing that is oftentimes missed. And this is an opportunity that we're drawing on like Western price practices. The, you know, the traditional diet of Mexico was incredibly healthy until they started adding in a bunch of westernized processed crap in addition to what was, you know, historically the traditional diet. So there's a lot of layer and nuance to this, and that's why I do actually kind of kick the can out a little bit and, and have some faith in people figuring this stuff out and actually, yeah, yeah, I'll leave it at that. That was good. Um, I have lived in 38 different places in my adult life, and I can really relate to what Daryl said because as somebody who's very savvy about my budget in terms of food costs, looking for deals, I can see a variation of about 200% between different areas that I've lived in my budget. And that's like, as somebody who's very educated, who does an obsessive amount of research and who will travel long distances to get really good strawberries. So... From that perspective, I can understand this, the problem, um, you know, different economic classes having different access to foods that may or may not be helpful for them and also just to the knowledge of what is good for them. But I actually think that in the long run, paleo, even the commercialization aspect and even that yoga aspect is going to be helpful because what we're seeing right now is this undercurrent. Once upon a time, people had this belief that XYZ food was good for me and XYZ food was bad for me. And this is still the mentality that most of America has. There's like two boxes for everything that we see. It's good for me or it's bad for me. There's not a lot of concern about the nuance between this might be good for me in some, some contexts and that sort of thing. And so we need to work with that mentality because it's probably not going to change in any of our lifetimes. 
But what paleo can do is start nudging different foods between those boxes. And, um, you know, we're seeing a resurrection of maybe higher cholesterol foods that are also very nutrient dense, like organ meats, getting put out of that bad for me box and putting into the good for me box. And if we can continue that trend of moving foods and shifting the underlying mentality that people approach food with, I think over over time, we're going to start seeing something like Rob was saying, like this mentality of the Western dream is to eat a bunch of processed garbage. If we can change that underlying mentality, we're going to see other things following behind it because uh, the industry is going to follow profit. And if that profit starts turning towards healthy foods being the ideal, then there's going to be a marketing sweep that comes behind that. There's going to be financial benefits that come behind that and support that and bring it perhaps to a more uh, accessible place for the average American. So that would be my hope. And I, I do resonate a lot with what Daryl said, just because I, I just moved from Portland, Oregon to a small island in Washington. And I am shocked at how much my food bill has gone up, even though I, I try my best to pick things from gardens, steal, you know, pears from people's trees when they're not looking. <laughs> and um, despite all those things, I've, I'm still struggling, you know, with the, trying to match my original food budget. So for somebody who doesn't have time to research things and who is maybe managing five children and a job, two jobs, three jobs, trying to make that all work, it's going to be a big struggle. So again, what we need to rely on is having this maybe elite movement kind of being obnoxious for a while, but eventually having this wake that follows behind it that is turning things and that is reassigning good for me and bad for me foods in a way that is going to be supported by the industry. So maybe best of all worlds. Just a one-sentence uh, one comment. Um, when I started paleo, I felt I had to be, you know, a PhD biochemist, uh, a chef, uh, who is very conversant in the kitchen, an exercise scientist, you know, etc. Fittest mo model for, for sure, you know. <laughs> and, and I remember, uh, my, I remember saying to my mother once, like, "Oh, mom, you've got to start using, stop using the sunflower oil for cooking and use extra virgin coconut oil." And she was like, "Really?" You know. And then, then she started talking about, "What about the saturated fat?" And I said, "Mom, no, I have the evidence. It's really, it's really, really good for you. That's what I use." And she's like, "How much does it cost?" <laughs> And I told her how much it costs, and she's like, there is no way on earth I'm going to spend that sort of money on something to cook my food in. And I remember going to see her a few weeks later, and she's like, oh, she's like, Daryl, I I'm, I'm started doing that kind of coconut oil stuff. And she prepared it herself. She made it herself. And I said, Mom, how did you? I was like, I have, I have no idea how you do that. I said, how did you work out how to do this? And she went, my grandmother taught me how to do this when I was a little girl. So I just wanted to emphasize, I know this is longer than a, a sentence, but it's not just, it's not just about the price point. It's, it's about not patronizing some of those communities and feeling that they have to step towards us. Because if they've really been getting things right for millennia, then what the heck are we talking about trying to tell them that we know best? Do you know what I mean? So some of that wisdom of the ancients and some of that knowledge which belongs to those cultures needs to be revisited for them who best know how to implement that. That's, that was my real point. Well, and I think what we get when we start going down that path is we start to see why some people might be resistant to the idea of paleo if they've been eating rice for generation upon generation and they're going to say, well, hey, this is, this is the lifeblood of my people. Why are you telling me that it's bad all of a sudden? I think when we have that respect for traditional food ways, we, we don't come across uh, as patronizing. And we do understand that maybe our views uh, could use some more nuance. But then that brings us to the kind of fundamental strength and weakness of paleo, which is that we're, we're so nuanced or we've become so nuanced. And then we have a hard time focusing and maybe breaking through to certain aspects of the culture. So paleo really kind of presents this paradox where right from the beginning, the idea is we've got this ancient body and ancient DNA and we're in this modern world. So right there, there's paradox, there's evolutionary mismatch. So the whole thing is kind of paradoxical. Do you think that uh, that structural, um, you know, it, paleo can't get out of that? Like there's no way to do paleo without paradox. And so we're kind of saying, well, we want more 
more focused, but we want to be diverse. How do we reconcile this? Do we do we just become okay with the paleo name maybe having less relevance and it's more the ideas? Where do we kind of where do we direct our efforts? And obviously, everybody here, I mean, you guys have flown from all over the world in some cases, spent tons of money to come here and hear these folks and everybody talk. You're you're part of the you're part of this too. You are this movement. So you know what can what can all of us do to to make a difference? And I think that's what we're really here for is to try to make the world a little bit better. And you here. Um, you know, I think Rob did it really well, and particularly in this new book, Wired to Eat. We are coming down to personalized nutrition. And the thing is, is that we're all individuals, and we all have different needs. And I would venture to guess, as many people are in this room, that's as many paleo diets as it exist, um, for sure, just in this room, not including everyone else. And I think one of the things particularly, and I'm going to get a little on a soapbox here, sorry. Um, you know, we have this tendency to be very judgmental um, as humans about everything, about the way somebody else lives, about the way somebody else eats, about the way somebody else drives, talks, you name it, listens to music, whatever the case may be. And the thing is, is that at the end of the day, you need to worry about what's on your plate, not what's on somebody else's. Now, if somebody asks you or you know that you can help better in a way that's not judgmental, that's where we need to go. That's where we need to get is, is giving out the information, not preaching. And the problem is, is that so many times we come across as preaching. And I can tell you, especially becoming a brand new evangelist of paleo, as Keith calls it, I was that way. I, and the thing is, is that when you start feeling a new normal and you start feeling uh, just this great, wonderful feeling of well-being and wholeness that you haven't felt all your life, of course, you want to shout that from the rooftops. You want to beat everybody over the head with it and what have you. But at the end of the day, you need to worry what's on your plate and not what's on somebody else's and that it works for you and, you know, and celebrate when something works for somebody else. And, you know, there's a lot of things Keith can get away with that I can't get away with. I can't eat. I'm happy for Keith to be able to have those things. I can't. And um, sometimes if I cheat and have it, um, which I hate that word cheat, but if I have it, I'm, I know that I'm going to pay for it and I consciously make that decision. I just think we really need to be more mindful about our own situation and, and just helping other people make it be their idea. Like if it's not their idea, they're not going to adopt it and they're going to be resistant. So. I think we've got maybe time for one more person to say one more thing. Have we have we have we said it all? We still haven't figured out what paleo is. So I've been involved with paleo for a long time and I hated the name from the beginning. Just detested it. Um, I think ancestral health is a much better overall moniker. I think that far too little emphasis is placed on uh, the work of Wesna Price. There's been all kinds of pissing matches back and forth with that. That's a whole interesting deal, but there's huge opportunity there, particularly if, if we're talking about reaching out to um, different cultures, because we, we can see where an intersection of a traditional diet plus westernized sugar and refined food is a disaster. So there's huge opportunity to, to just decouple all the emotionality around it and whatnot. But also people like having some something that they identify with. And I think that this is the, the push and pull. People want to be part of a tribe. They want something to identify with. We need something to call it so that there's some starting point, you know. And this is kind of the challenge that I had with writing Wired to Eat. You start at a 30,000 foot level describing kind of ancestral health and the whole unprocessed foods. But then does it go keto? Does it go this way? Does it go that way? And that's where we get really granular. And so you're moving from high focus to low focus and we need to be comfortable with doing that. And it's not easy. It is completely counter to our evolutionary wiring. Like we are wired to have immediate needs, immediate necessity. We address those and then we sleep and reproduce and life is good and, and that's it. So even the, the necessity of doing that is something that we need to stick in the frontal lobe and isn't instinctual.
Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for, for shaking it up, talking about the state of paleo.